picture that you see in front of you is, um, comes actually out of the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, I think it's about the second chapter of Ezekiel, the Lord, the, the sky, the heavens broke, and the, this chariot, what I refer to as the chariot of the Lord, came down. God, of course, is seated on the throne. You can, if you can tell, that's a throne up there. And underneath was the wheel within the wheel, covered with many eyes, if you, if you read the uh, scripture there. And on either corner there, right adjacent to those wheels, were four living creatures. The four living creatures actually had four faces, one facing north, south, east, and west. They did not turn when they moved. They just went in, a, went in another direction, and they were always looking in the right direction no matter which way they went. They didn't have to turn their head because they had four faces. And one day God spoke to me, and he told me, he said, my word, my, he said, the reason there's so much confusion in the book of Revelation, he said, is because there are churches that believe that they have the interpretation and the understanding of the book of Revelation, but he said they, they neglect a reality, and that reality is that there's more than one perspective and per, uh, uh, way of looking at things. And I began to uh, see that when I uh, began to look at some of the commentaries and saw that there were four main uh, approaches to the interpretation of Revelation. One was historical. The other is what's referred to as idealism or spiritual, symbolical, or dramatic approach. The other is futuristic. And uh, the last one is preterist. Now, preterist, and it's a little confusing until you, until you see uh, what these are. And, uh, but anyway, what God was showing to me was that if, if you take, for instance, the preterist uh, way of interpretation, you'll only look at things as a preterist. You'll never see the future, and you'll never see the historic. You'll never see the idealistic. You'll always see that preterist interpretation. And in order to get the full picture, you have to be able to see from every side the fullness of the Spirit. Another way, he, he, uh, one day um, I was praying and he showed me a nickel. And I was like, oh, this is kind of strange, you know, got God to show me this nickel. And he said, this is my word to my people. He said, turn it around and see the other side. And the nickel turned. And I was like, okay, so what does this mean? And then, it, then I realized what he was saying was, when you think you understand Keep meditating in the word and turn it around and look at the other side of it. And instead of denominations, and this, this is what I believe the Lord is a, was a little upset with the way things are, not that he is surprised, but that we've divided the church in so many different ways because we tend to see things through our own eyes. And then we tend to, to try to find people that agree with us and then we get together and then we fight against the rest in the body of church who don't believe the same way we do. And that shouldn't be that way. God made us different and he made us with different perception. And if we, if we were to listen to each other, we would begin to grow that much uh, more so. Um, it, in fact, the next slide just kind of zooms into the living creature there. Isn't technology wonderful? <laughs> It was a little, you know, an aggravating pop-up thing. Okay. So anyway, so we zoomed in, and you could better make out the faces here. One's like a lion. One's like a, uh, a man. One's like a, 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 a bull, and the other one was like an eagle. And in fact, you actually see this in the book of Revelation in the, in the fourth chapter there. But anyway, the whole purpose of this slide was just to, to suggest that... When you study prophecy, and it's not just the book of Revelation, but it's prophecy, you have to keep in mind that God's word, and the, way, the reason it works this way, because it's God's word. God's word is so compacted with truth. It's so, there's so much there, and it's so concentrated. It's like, <laughs> it's like this. <laughs> It's like this. It's dehydrated. You know, this is a dehydrated Neapolitan ice cream. And it's like it's all compressed and, you know, you could fit so much in there. And God's word is like that.
You didn't know that would become a, a learning uh, tool tonight, did you? So anyway, we're talking about the seven churches. And uh, <clears throat> there, John was on, on the island Patmos, and he was uh, writing his book, actually, to the church, Pergamus, uh, Thyatira, Sardis, Smyrna, Philadelphia, Ephesus, and Laodicea, and all these exist in Turkey. You can see the next uh, map here. And uh, I don't know if you can really make it out there. But those little purple dots, those are those churches. They're all in one area there in Turkey. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, he said, saying, I, he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Now, John was instructed to send the, his, this book of Revelation to seven different churches in seven different locations and seven different pastors. If you remember, Jesus was holding the star, seven stars in his hand, and, the, um, and, and he said that the, uh, that the stars represent, the candlesticks represented, uh, in fact, go to the next picture here. Uh, go down. There's a, yeah, that, their picture there. And Jesus is standing there in the midst of the seven candlesticks. And you can't, I don't know if you can really make it out, but in his right hand, he's holding seven stars there. And he said the seven candlesticks were the seven churches. The seven can the stars in his hand represented the, uh, the seven uh, pastors or angels of the church. And the word was actually angel, but it, it is messenger of the church or the church, yeah, of the particular church. And it's interesting that, you know, when Paul wrote his, epistle to the Romans. He sent it to the church at Rome when he wrote his epistle to the Galatians, sent it at the, to the church in Galatia. To Ephesus, it was, the Ephesians was sent to the church at Ephesus. But it's interesting that John was instructed to send us to seven different churches. Now, I find that interesting, but I believe the reason is, is because the devil was so bent on trying to prevent this word from getting out to the church. This, this book, this last book of the Bible, has suffered a lot of criticism in, in Christianity, and uh, uh, many of the Christians won't even, you know, won't even partake of this book. Many of the early church wanted to discard this book. Um, they were uh, concerned with its, um, what they thought was a, kind of a Jewish nature to it. And we'll look into some of that. But I believe the reason it was sent to the seven churches is that it was sent to seven different locations so that there was no way the devil was going to get this word out of circulation because it was sent to seven different places. And also, it wasn't just sent to seven places. It was sent to seven churches which John himself had founded and appointed those pastors. So he, he trusted those men. Anyway, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, and chapter 2 of Revelation is where we're pretty much focusing on today. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, if you can find a, the scripture there. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them to be liars, or found them liars. And that is a good thing. This is a accommodation to this church. Many things are brought up to these seven churches, and some of the things that are brought up are not good things. But this is a good thing. They have tried those that say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. You will recall that we were warned about false teachers in the church. How many read this New Testament and see that there's repeated warnings that false teachers, wolves, and sheep's clothing will come. In fact, uh, we have a scripture in Acts uh, chapter 20, and, uh, 29 and 30. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. What, I'm try what I want to show you here, and I did, not dis <laughs> I, I did not define what preterist was. Preterist is the... the 
the um, in, uh, perspective that when John wrote the book, he wrote it to people living in his day that understood what was going on, and he was referring to things going on in his time. And those seven churches, the things he was writing about were going on in his time. And it's interesting that this warning from Acts already in John's day was the wolves in the church. Things were already going on. The liars were already there teaching heresy and teaching false doctrine. But the church at Ephesus had an accommodation because they were able to see through that. They were able to overcome there. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 3. And has borne and has patience for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. See, everything was going good. They triumphed over the liars. They could see through them. They were smart enough in the word of God and, and had, had matured enough in the word of God and studied enough in the word of God that they were able to tell the truth from the false. But you see that even, even though they were, were maturing in the Lord and even though they were strong in the word of God and in the spirit of God, they still left their first love. They were beginning to fall away. They were beginning to slip away, if you will. And so Jesus says to them, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works. Many times I look at a church today, a church that does not believe in repentance anymore, a church that is so uh, uh, grace-minded that they think that grace is going to cover everything. And grace does cover a lot of things. And God's mercy protects us from things that we should, we should get sometimes slapped around and punished and, and have the devil beat us up. But it's the mercy of God and the grace of God that keeps his hand off of us, praise God. But when we are in a state of falling away, no matter how slight it is, there's an admonition of the Lord to repent. It's not that God doesn't want us to have fun or wants to, to, uh, uh, to cause us uh, anxiety. He wants us to repent for our own good because if we don't, worse things will follow. And so this is what he says to this church. He says, repent and do the works, the first works or else. I like to read that and say, repent or else. That kind of speaks loud to me. If I'm in, you know, if, if the Holy Spirit would convict me of sin, I like my, uh, my sensitivity in the Holy Spirit to be such that I hear these words, repent or else. That's the way my dad used to say, repent or else. And he meant it. And I think that God means it when he says, repent or else I will come to thee unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Uh, everybody understands what a candlestick is. A candlestick in, in those days, they didn't have electricity, right? They didn't have light bulbs. They had a candlestick, and on the candlestick was a flame. And you carry the candlestick into the room, and that gave the light. And if the candlestick had been removed from its place, what would happen? Darkness, right? And it's a spiritual application also to our lives. When we're reading these things, these things were done and these churches were instructed for our benefit. When we are in a state, when we're beginning to lose our first love, or we're beginning to fall or backslide away from God, there is the threat there that the candlestick, the light of God will be removed from out of its place and we will end up in total darkness if we are not sensitive enough to the Spirit of God to go to God. He's faithful enough to, convince, uh, to, to, to uh, forgive us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we have to act when the Holy Spirit brings this up in our life. And then he says to this church, But this thou hast, thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, I'm not going to get into what those are right now, but we will in a little while, the Nicolaitans. But 
this is an account, uh, accommodation. He says, Thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, I think we have a map here. And this shows, you can see Eph Ephesus up there in uh, that location of Ephesus, that uh, main part of land there, that is uh, the nation Turkey. Well, what about the historical Ephesus or city of Ephesus? It is known to be the home of the goddess Diana. Uh, if you may remember reading in the book of Acts, chapter 19, verse 35. It was very, uh, the worship of Diana was very popular. And then there was also a great temple of Diana. And that temple had been destroyed and re erected seven different times, or rebuilt seven different times. And it is considered to be one of the seven wonders of the world. How many of you have ever paid, played Trivial Pursuit? Now, aren't you glad you came tonight? Because when the question comes up, to name one of the seven wonders of the world, you'll be able to because you came here tonight, praise God. See, God knew. God knew you were going to need that piece of information. Well, the Temple of Diana, it wasn't just false gods and goddesses that were the problem. Yes, that's, that's a problem where uh, people worship false gods and false goddesses. But these pagan religions, they were, it was not just worshiping myths, but it, those who really, really got into the worship of, of these false gods, they were actually worshiping demons. And those who were really uh, strong in that were practicing magic, or what we would call sorcery and witchcraft. And so this was prominent in this area. Now what about the, these Nicolaitans? How many have heard uh, a man by the name Irenaeus? If you ever heard of Irenaeus, he was one of the early church fathers uh, who lived in the time shortly after um, John wrote this book. And we have many of the early church writings uh, available to us. Irenaeus said that these were disciples of Nicholas. Now, in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, Nicholas is mentioned as one of those deacons. I like to refer to him as Saint Nicholas. Have you ever heard Matthew referred to as Saint Matthew and Luke, Saint Luke, John, Saint John? Well, this is Saint Nicholas. Now, I'm not saying that he's Santa Claus, but these followers of Nicholas, one of, one of their... Uh, characteristics were unrestrained indulgence, indifference to adult, uh, adultery, and indifference to eating things sacrificed to idols. There's another, uh, another of the church fathers or the writings of the early church by the man, a man named Hippolytus who says uh, these disciples of Nicholas were departed from the true faith and doctrine. And then Ignatius, another one who was right around that time frame. We're talking as early as, you know, maybe 150 A.D. These are when these, these individuals wrote their, uh, their writings. He said, Nicholas himself was not a heretic, but some falsely claimed him to be their apostle and their teacher. So anyway, these Nicolaitans that John is referring to, these are a group of people who had these traits and characteristics of heresy and adultery and fornication and, and uh, offering sacrifices to idols, and they counted themselves as being of the, from, of the teaching and the apostle Nicholas. Let's go to, uh, into Smyrna now, and you can see Smyrna on the map of Smyrna there. You see, you see it right under Lydia to the left-hand side, and it brings us to Revelation chapter 2, verse 8, unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. Now, this church was suffering a lot of trials. How many have gone through trials in their life? You can go through trials in life. Just because you're a Christian does not mean that everything's going to be roses all the time. But you'll notice here 
that he says, I know your works, tribulation and poverty. And, and isn't it, aren't you, aren't you glad that God knows what you're going through when you're going through these things? But I love this here where he says, but thou art rich. See, sometimes we get depressed. We say, oh, oh, woe is me. Or how am I going to make it? But we have two pieces of good news here. Number one, God knows our situation. And number two, we are rich. We're rich in the fact that we have God. And if we have God inside us, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. I'm telling you that I have learned that no matter what state and what place and what our situation is, if we have God, we have the majority on our side. Nothing can topple us. Nothing can overcome us as long as we have God inside and we don't let the devil in. See, a lot of it's up to us if we don't let the devil in. But anyway, he says, I know thy works are tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. This is very similar to um, something that Paul wrote in Romans when he said that some say they're Jews or some are Jews outwardly, and not all that are called Jews are Jews. You remember that scripture in the, Ro in the book of Romans? And you could say that about the church today. Not everyone that says they're a Christian is really a Christian. We know that. How many, how many know that not everyone that says... Did you, do you realize that there are... There's about... It's not quite yet seven, 7 billion people in the world. It's over 6 billion people in the world. And almost 2 billion of them claim to be Christians. If two billion Christians were in the world, we wouldn't have the kinds of problems we had today. So not everyone that says they're a Christian is a Christian. And that really is what he's referring to here. He says, I know thy works, tribulation, poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. And then he says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. It's, uh, it's interesting that whenever trials come upon us, that no matter what the devil can do to us, if we keep our sights on the fact that the crown of life is there waiting for us, we can go through a lot if we keep focused on the fact that God is there at the end. You might have heard the expression, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's good to know that light isn't a train. It's actually God. Praise God, isn't it? And there's a crown reserved for all of us who would remain faithful. But you'll also notice here that the devil does have the ability to cast some of you into prison, he said. Remember the book of Job, the devil was able to do certain things. God had a hedge of protection around Job, but he allowed the devil to do certain things. But the devil could not extend beyond that place where God allowed him to have permission. I want you to know that God inside you is greater than anything the devil can do. And with every temptation, with every trial, God's going to give you the way out. All you have to do is hold on. He will give you that crown of life if you stay faithful. And then in verse 11, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. Kind of a different story with this church than was with Ephesus there. <clears throat> the historical city of Smyrna, uh, the, the word itself actually means bitterness. Smyrna means bitterness. And it, it also means mirror. It actually comes from the same uh, root that uh, it would be interpreted as mirror or myrrh or uh, bitterness. And myrrh was an ointment that was associated with death. And uh, this uh, city of Smyrna was most popular in history uh, because of its association with uh, a, a um, martyr by the name of Polycarpus. Have anybody heard of Polycarpus? And Polycarpus was around 155 A.D., and um, he was martyred. And you can see the, the description about uh, the persecutions that would come against this church. It's interesting that after the martyrdom of Polycarp, 
or Parlycarp, um, that uh, the, uh, the city was destroyed by earthquakes uh, about um, 25 years after, it was completely destroyed. So it was like God's uh, judgment upon the place. Another thing it's known for, it was the birthplace of Homer. Not this Homer. Do we go to the next picture? Yes, the, the, this is Homer. <laughs> yeah, the wrong, I don't know how they got in there. Homer and Hesiod were regarded as prophets to the Greek and Romans, the, the Greek and Roman gods and the myths. They regarded the teachings of these men just like we regard Isaiah and Daniel and Ezekiel and, and all the prophets, or even Moses. These were considered to be great prophets of of their gods, if you will. And this town or this city was the birthplace of, the, uh, of uh, Homer. And uh, so they had strong influence on what is referred to as the Olympian theology, which is Greek mythology, if you will. And it's interesting that in, in mythology, there was this uh, person by the name of Myra, which was the mother of Adonis or Adonai, which, uh, whose name means Lord Tammuz, if you've ever heard of Lord Tammuz. He actually appears in Ezekiel chapter 8, Tammuz, the worship of uh, Tammuz. And uh, he was very prominent in, in what's referred to as the mother-child cult. Anybody ever heard of mother-child cult? Well, we'll get into that a little later. Um, but anyway, uh, so that's the historical church of uh, a Smyrna. And now let's look at uh, Pergamos here in Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. And again, you should have a map up here. A Pergamum, or it says Pergamum on the map. It's Pergamos in your Bible. But you see it's the, uh, it's the second, second name there on the map there. And all these churches were right next to each other in, in Turkey. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which has the sharp, the sharp sword with two edges. How many know what that is? The sharp sword with two edges. Do you know in Revelation chapter 1 and in Revelation chapter 19, Jesus is seen with a, sh a sharp sword coming out of his mouth. And he says that that's what he's going to judge the nations with is the word that comes out of his mouth. It's like, it's quick. It's a, it's a living word, a living sword, if you will. You'll notice that it said it has a sharp sword with two edges. Well, what does that mean? Well, what it means to me, when I read the word of God, I am glad to tell you that there are so many blessings and I love the blessings of God. And those blessings of God and those promises of God, they mean a lot to me. And they lift me up and they encourage me and I know that I am the righteousness of God through Jesus and through his blood and they refer to me. But also if I step out and I do what's not convenient, kind of a biblical term, not convenient for just walk in sin, the same sword or the same word that gives me blessing and honor and, and causes me to be able to come into his presence says guilty and condemns me if I don't repent. And that's what he's talking about, about a double edge, uh, a sword with two edges. Anyway, he says, These says, saith he which has a sharp sword with two edges, which is obviously Jesus. Now watch this. This is very interesting. I know thy works, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. How many know that Paul said that Satan was the god of this earth? He you know, also called him the prince of the power of the air. Most people are not aware because, like I said, most Christians do not read this book. And most Christians are not aware that the Bible actually talks about a place and a location upon this earth where there is a thing called Satan's seat. If Satan is a king oh, and sovereign over entities, and emissaries and angelic beings and demons that he sends out to do and execute his, his business, then he rightfully, it makes sense, he rightfully sits upon a throne. And there is literally a place that the Bible has targeted and pinpointed as the location, the very location 
of Satan's seat. And it's interesting that is in Pergamum. Can you go back to the map and then we'll come back to the scripture, go back where you see that Pergamum area there right under Mycenae there. That is where the Bible says Satan's seat is. This becomes extremely important in biblical prophecy because it's where Satan's main... It's just like Jerusalem is important to God. Pergamum is important to Satan because it's where his throne was set. Anyway, in these Jesus' own words, he says, I know your works and you dwell even where Satan's seat is. You hold fast my name and has not denied my name. Even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, once again, where Satan dwelleth. Twice in the only places in the Bible where he says this is where Satan's seed is and this is where Satan actually dwells. We have this image that Satan sits down there in hell on a throne. Have you ever seen that? That's like the world's image of Satan in hell in, around, amidst the burning fl f the fire. Satan is not in hell in the burning of fire. He will eventually be plunged into the lake of fire according to the scripture. But that's not his domain. The Bible says he literally has a place where he sits and dwells, and it's right there in the land of Turkey. What else is in the land of Turkey, by, by the way? Anybody know? The Ark. Noah's Ark actually landed on the opposite side of Turkey. If you, well, I don't think the map shows, you know, because the map only shows um, this western corner on the far east end of Turkey is where the, the ark sits. Isn't that interesting? I find it interesting. Anyway, I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Now, we're not going to get into the Old Testament part here, but if you're familiar with the Old Testament, there is a story of this prophet Balaam. And you'll probably remember it if you attended uh, Sunday school years ago and somebody told you the story of Balaam and where the, the, the donkey turned around and spoke at him. Anybody familiar with that story? where God actually used the donkey or the jackass or however, what you would call it, to speak to him? Well, Balaam was a true prophet of God. And this person, Balak, Balak he wanted to hire him to curse God's people. Well, every time the prophet of God would open up his mouth, a blessing would come out. And so... This Balak who hired him was try wanting to pay him to curse his people or God's people, said, you know, I'm not going to pay you this money. You said you would do this job for me. And Balaam said, well, I can't. Every time I open my mouth, I have a blessing. But he told him how to prevail against God's people. He said to get them to follow after false gods and commit fornication with women uh, outside of the land of Israel, and they would cause a stumbling block to cause them to stumble themselves and then God would curse them himself. Remember that? If those of you are familiar with the story, and I've pretty much given you the gist of it without actually turning to it uh, because of time, but you can look that all up when uh, you go home tonight if you want more information. But that's the basic gist here of the story. Now, the thing that's interesting here is back to verse 12. Jesus said, he, it's he, this is he who has the sharp sword with two edges coming out of his mouth. And then he reminds us of this story. And I told you as we got into this that God has the protective wall around us and that we are actually the ones that remove ourselves, take ourselves out of the place of blessing and put ourselves in the place of judgment. And we don't have to stay there. And immediately, and I know you've experienced it as well as me, and I probably experienced it 200 times if, if, if none, and it certainly has been more than none. So uh, we're, we're like a red flag goes up. 
It's, it's like a danger, a danger signal saying, hey, you know what, something's wrong here. And all you have to do when the Holy Spirit ra raises that red flag is to confess your sin and get straightened out right now before something worse comes upon you. And it takes us, unfortunately, so many years before, you know, we finally straighten out and we do that and we finally uh, repent and we walk with God finally. But this is what Balaam told Balak to do and this worked in Israel's case. This is what Satan does to us. This particular church was living and dwelling where Satan's seat is. They had much... Uh, trials and much challenges, if you will, probably more so than uh, any of the other churches that we've looked at so far. And then he says, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now we talked about them already in the previous church. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now that word, even though it was said to the church, that's something that God's Spirit says to us as well. And the neat thing about it is if you're in a situation where you're walking in the love of God and the blessings of God and you're not walking in sin, that doesn't affect you. That doesn't scare you because you know God's on your side. The only time that double-edged sword is a threat is when you're out of His will. And He's made it so easy for you to come back in His will, hasn't He, praise God, by the blood of Jesus but there are so many today that refuse to repent. And it's a pretty scary picture because he is coming soon. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes, will I give to eat of the hidden manna, will give him a white stone, and in the new stone a name written which no man knows, saving he that received it. And it's very interesting, if you'll note, it says to him who overcomes. In fact, over and over and over, you'll notice to these churches, he says, to him who overcomes. It means we don't all automatically get what the overcomer gets. It's up to us. God saves us. He gives us his word. He gives us grace and mercy. He sets us on our feet and he expects us to walk the walk. And if we walk the walk, he'll help us, he'll strengthen us, he'll encourage us, and he'll get us through, and we will make it as an overcomer in life. Because God is for us, not against us, praise God. And this, this chapter, probably more so than any other chapter in the Bible, shows us how we slip up and how we fall. We actually open the door to ourselves by setting a stumbling block into our own lives. The historical Pergamus, we, as we said, it was the Satan's, it was known as the Satan's seat. At that time period, the world referred to it as Satan's seat. It was very popular to be um, equated with that. Uh, this Pergamus became the capital of the Roman province of Asia. Remember, Rome was the empire, the Roman Empire in the day of Jesus. What well, was still the Roman, the you know, the great Roman Empire after Jesus, and they took this spot there in Pergamus where it was called Satan's seat, and that became a principal center of imperial worship. When I say imperial worship, remember in the Roman Empire, they not only had the worship of all the Roman gods and all the Greek gods, they also had the worship of the Roman emperor. emperor. Now, something interesting also about this thing about Pergamus, in, there's a history behind it, and I'm kind of getting off here, it, maybe it's not the right time, but since I started, uh, do you remember Babylon? Babylon, where uh, the Jews were sent for 70 years while Israel or, or uh, the Judah was overcome, and then they were sent there for 70 years, and the whole thing with Daniel's book and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and all those stories, and then they came back. Well, Babylon at the time was the, 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 the call, the seat of uh, the, uh, of um, paganism and false worship and idolatry. And Satan's seat at one time was there, but 
at the destruction of Babylon, Satan's seat was moved because the high priest from Babylon moved the priestly headquarters to this place, Pergamum. And that's when it was said that Satan's seat was moved to that place. Just a little piece of information really outside of our lesson for today. It was this place, um, Pergamus, was also the religious center uh, for the worship of Zeus, Athena, and Dionysus, and especially the serpent god Asclepius. Or As Asclepius. And uh, we have a, a, the statue here of, the, of him, and he, had, he was known for the, uh, the stick, and you, you can see it better on this side. That's a serpent winding up and crawling up. And you can see it on the other side as well. Our medical association has actually adopted that symbol. Now, it's very interesting, and I'm not coming against the medical association for adopting the symbol, but this symbol was the symbol of this god. And this place was known worldwide for the supernatural healings that took place in honor to this God, there was a great shrine there that all the world knew about in this city of Pergamus as well. And people would go there from all over the world. Anyone who was sick and had an ailment that was critical, they would go there to be healed. And the funny thing about it is, many of them were healed. Satan has power. He does have power, and he does have power to heal. Not everything, just because somebody uh, does something in some religion and a person is healed miraculously, it doesn't mean it's of God. Satan has always exhibited powers to heal. In the day of Antichrist, there will be such great delusion that people will be deceived. Praise God, I'm not going to be there. And I pray that you're not going to be there as well. Praise God. But it was, there was a great shrine there. Now, we also mentioned this Antipas. And here's a, a, a picture of what they referred to as, uh, the early church referred to as uh, uh, St. Antipas at the time. He was actually roasted in a brazen bull. Now, the brazen bull was, was used for two reasons. Well, actually three. One was to offer... You ever read in the Bible where they talk about offering up a child to Moloch? What they had was a brazen bull. They would light a fire underneath it. It would become red hot. And they would put a baby inside. And the baby would just burn up inside this brazen bull. And that was offering a child to Moloch. Well, they also would drive evil spirits out. If, you, if they believed you had evil spirits, they would throw you in this bull until the evil spirits would come out. Well, I don't know. <laughs> so if the evil spirits came out, well, you're dead, right? And then the last thing was it was used for torture. And here was Antipas. It was, can you see the next picture there? Here, this is the way it was, it was made. You see, there was a compartment there where a man would fit. And then there was fire underneath him. And, of course, the, uh, the bull was made uh, out of brass. And the brass would heat up, and the, and the man would just cook to death. And that's how this Antipas was uh, martyred there. <clears throat> and then there's the uh, historical church of Thyatira. And uh, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, it says, Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. And now I, the picture I have here might, uh, might be kind of a familiar picture to you. Uh, you'll see there the all-seeing eye, and you'll see also the familiar image of somebody who's reading in the crystal ball. Thyatira was connected and believed to be the place that uh, where this idea of the crystal ball came from. And they would say it was connected with the all-seeing eye. Anyway, he says, I know thy works in charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. 
Never, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Now he's talking to the church again. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, who calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat the things sacrificed unto idols. It seems like it's the same doctrine of Balaam, doesn't it? And we have a picture here of... Uh, and this is not really Jezebel, but it's a, you know, it's just a typical, what would be, have been a, a, a typical uh, prophetess in that day. And this city was known, uh, there was a great, the great temple to the goddess Sambith, which is, uh, if, if you've ever heard of Sybil, it was a Chaldean oracle called Sybil, Sybil who was also a goddess, and she was supposed to be the one who could communicate directly to the serpent, and all people would come. In fact, this picture here, the second one, they would come to her. Uh, she was also called a Delphian oracle, and um, she would reveal to people what, the, what this serpent god said. And so this is what this city was known for. Uh, she, uh, there was much of this uh, divination, if you will, in this area. And so evidently, what we read in verse 20, this church was confronted with the fact that there, was, there were women in the church who were prophetesses that were, were telling the people, they were seducing the, the, the children of God, and telling him it was all right to commit fornication and sacrifice things to idols and to, and to consult with the serpent god to get divine knowledge and to consult with crystal balls and the psychics. And, and how many of you know, you know people who say they're Christians and yet they'll go to a fortune teller or something and they don't see that there's anything, they don't believe that there's anything wrong with it. Might I say that this shows that evident, there definitely is something wrong with it. You don't communicate with the devil when you're supposed to be a child of God. Praise God. And anyway, there was, this was going on in the church. Now, there are some people in the church that are associated with what's referred to as a New Age movement. They're doing all kinds of things in connection with demonic spirits and contacting demonic spirits, and yet they attend church just like you do. You don't know who they are. Revelation chapter 2, verse 21, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. It's interesting that God is so, so loving, and he's so, he's, he has so much grace towards people. Here, here is someone in the church who calls herself a prophetess, leading people astray, consulting the devil, and yet God is begging her to repent and turn from her wicked ways. It says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication. She repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Now the adultery, I would say it was not physical adultery. I believe what, they, what God is referring to. Because how many people could she possibly be committing physical adultery with? I believe what the whole, the whole gist of this is that this woman was create, was committing spiritual adultery with people, leading them to, to have communication with the serpent God. And anything, anything, relationship that, and communication that you would have with demonic spirits, God views as adultery. Why? Because you're married to him. You're not supposed to be involved in any of this. And if you know anyone that is involved in, in any of this, you have the right and even the authority to tell them that they are not living a Christian life and they are not going to, to escape if they continue to, to, uh, to continue on in that road that they're traveling. Now God says, Behold, I will cast her into a bed and then that commit adultery with her into great tribulation except they repent of their deeds and I will kill her children with death. All the churches shall know that I am he that searches the reins and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say unto the rest, Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine and have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put none other burden. You'll notice that God 
calls this type of activity that this prophetess is engaged in and everyone that she's, she's cultivated and brought into her realm of communication with Satan, he calls that the depths, a knowledge of the depths of Satan and he holds all of them accountable for, for where they're at. But you'll notice that uh, he says, to the rest of them who don't know this doctrine, so just because you have those people in the world around you does not mean that God's holding you accountable for what they are doing. But he still expects us to stand up for the truth. Praise God. He says, I will put none other burden upon you if you haven't been involved in the depths of Satan like this communication with him. But that which you already have, hold fast till I come. And that really could relate to every one of us because in our lives there's certain things that we have and God is telling us to hold on to what you have. There's so many ways that Satan has to try to rob us. Remember, he is the thief. He's a murderer, the thief, the destroyer. He comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus came that we may have life and have it abundantly and more abundantly. So hold fast to what you have is, is, the, is this word that he's telling the church. And he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter. They shall be broken to shivers uh, even as I received of my father and I will give him the morning star. Now some other information about this historical uh, city of Thyatira. It's interesting that it is the best known, this place is best known for their peculiar emphasis upon trade guilds. How many, tra how many know what a trade guild is? In the ancient days, you, if you wanted to be a mason, for instance, you had to belong to the guild. If you wanted to be a carpenter, you had to belong to the guild. In this city, you could not be employed unless you belonged to the guild. That was what this church in particular was confronted with. They could not be employed unless they were faithful members of the guild. And it was, if you were a faithful, if you were a member of the guild, you were required to worship the God of the particular guild. And you were required to keep the feast days of that particular worship of that God out in the open. And so, it was a terrible place to be a Christian because there was no employment unless you decided that, you know, that God was going to turn his head from it and, and look away. And many of the, ch the, uh, the church at that time would have been tempted to do that. Uh, it was mandatory, if you will, to become that, uh, to become a member of the guild. And uh, it's obvious that, uh, or it's believed that Jezebel, this prophetess, was teaching Christians that it was okay to belong to the guild. Remember, she's the one who speaks for, for the divine serpent, or, or the, the serpent God. And she's the one who leads them into spiritual fornication and adultery and teaches them to offer up things to other gods. And so she is standing up, making herself a prophet, is telling Christians that it's okay to do it. God understands. After all, you need to have employment, right? God understands. And we have this same voice today in the church. And I'm saying in this church, but in the church worldwide, especially in this nation, we have voices saying that there's certain things that are okay for us as Christians to be involved with. You know, years ago, there was a much, uh, a much uh, uh, more uh, uh, separation of church members in the world. But as we get closer and closer and closer to the end, people are being engaged in, in uh, having to do with things that our ancestors would never have been involved with. Now, there's something that's, off, uh, that's really per, uh, peculiar that came up when considering this fourth church. The early church fathers 
who lived shortly after John, they reported that they had no knowledge of any church in Thyatira. And yet John set, sent the book to the seven churches, one of them being Thyatira. It's also peculiar that John wrote more to this church than to any other church. So either the church was underground and nobody really knew about it except for people you know, who, who were close like John, or there was no church and I believe there had to have been a church in Thyatira. So it must have been, people must have been more underground so that they, they could have employment and yet not be involved openly worshiping these gods and truly being a Christian and keeping, uh, and keeping uh, to their faith. Tertullian, who wrote in 145, 220 AD, wrote that the no church existed at Thyatira. Epiphanius in 367 AD writes that John must have wrote prophetically of a future church at Thyatira. And... Uh, in 363 AD, when the Council of Laodicea got together, which included 36 prominent bishops of Asia, including bishop from Ephesus, they rejected the book of Revelation as non-canonical. Now, the canon of the scriptures, you know what that refers to, right? The biblical canon of the scriptures is for, for Christians is the 66 books we have in our Bible, okay? Um, uh, was it 39 from the Old Testament, 27 from the New Testament? That's called the canon of the scriptures. Remember I said that the book was and has been under attack all the way through history. And here at three, uh, when I say 363 AD, they, the council rejected the book of Revelation as not being part of the Bible, not being authored by John. Well, it's just so interesting, now it makes sense, why did John send it to seven people, who he, seven churches, who he himself was the one who founded those churches, and seven pastors who he himself had appointed at those churches. They knew that they got the book, and they knew that those church, you know, that John was the author of the book, but about 300 years, a little, a little uh, less than 300 years after John wrote the book, the church is willing unanimously to put aside this book. I don't know if you're aware of this, but Martin Luther, obviously everybody's heard about Martin Luther. Martin Luther had problems with the book of Revelation. He almost wanted to throw it away as well. There has been much criticism, much debate against the book of Revelation, and yet, this book has, in the, in the beginning of the book, it's the only book that says that there's a special, peculiar blessing upon anyone. In fact, let's read that. Go to the first chapter of Revelation. It's the only book that has this. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. No, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. There's no other book that has that blessing on it. And you can understand perhaps why uh, there's been so much criticism of this, of this book. Well, there must be a reason Satan doesn't want you to study this book. There must be a reason that Satan doesn't want you to believe this book, to know what this book is. Well, I think one of those things is because it tells you where his seat is. And once again, his seat being in Turkey it becomes very important as we go further on in understanding biblical prophecy. But all of this debate gave, actually brought revelation to the church in the latter days because remember in the beginning I started talking about the perspectives of interpretation of the scripture? And by some of the uh, leaders in the church saying that, well, maybe it, John was speaking prophetically of churches to come. They begin to look at that and pray about it and the Holy Spirit begin to give them revelation. And sure enough, we discover that the books were written to seven historical churches, but they were also represented seven prophetic church dispensations or, or age periods 
that the church has been able now to identify. If you're taking notes, this is what they are. The dispensation of Ephesus uh, stands for the period of between 70 and 170 A.D. Um, Smyrna stands for a period of 170 to 312 A.D. Pergamus from 312 to 606 A.D. Thyatira 606 to 1520 A.D. Sardis to 1500 to 1750 A.D. Philadelphia 750 to 1939 A.D. Laodicea from 1939 A.D. and forward. Where does it put us? Laodicea. Laodicea. Lukewarm. Lukewarm church, which Christ says, you know, I wish you were either hot or cold, but since you're not, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. That's not a good place to be. Now, you know, is there any flexibility or room, you know, to, to move these dates? Sure. Nothing. These dates, this is not out of the Bible. This is just what uh, our leaders in the church filled with the Holy Spirit have come to the conclusion that these dates kind of began and ended prophetically right around there. And, uh, but it is interesting to see that at the end of that seventh, that Laodicean period, there's nowhere left for the church to go but into the tribulation or into the fourth chapter, which the first verse in the fourth chapter has an open door and a voice saying, come up hither. So after the church in Laodicea, there's only two places the church living today can end up. Either they're going to be called up or they're going to be spit out of Jesus Christ's mouth into the tribulation. And that's where we set today. Now, very quickly, I would like to... Uh, I would like to just go over something of Ephesus and we, we will... Uh, we will uh, conclude.